ready then? Okay, mm-hmm. well, yeah, sure, but I need to know who's got ready. So tell me a little bit more about your character in Squadron 42. Well, I play Lieutenant Commander Steve Colton. He's a lifer, kind of blunt guy, not a people person. Uh, they say he doesn't teach as much as hammer people into shape. But he's a true believer in, in, in the cause, and uh, I, I enjoy the fact that my father was in the Navy. Uh, I knew a lot of guys like this, lifers, sort of uh, no-nonsense guys, uh, sometimes resentful of the more educated college boys. But uh, he's the sole survivor of his very first mission. His entire crew was wiped out. He was the only survivor, which got him the nickname Old Man. Uh, they say prematurely in the script, but maybe they're being kind. I mean, they, I, feel, I certainly feel uh, I've grown to play an old man, but uh, uh, mostly it's because, uh, you know, he got the nickname because he was uh, the sole survivor of this horrendous massacre. Having played, um, I guess, the young hotshot pilot archetype in a few different contexts before, including Wing Commander, mm. what's it like stepping into, I guess, a familiar environment in terms of you know, sci-fi and this, this kind of fantasy, but in that, in that elder statesman role? Well, it's a whole new ball game. I mean, I have seen this kind of technology on the DVD extras for Planet of the Apes and Avatar, and I found the making of as fascinating as the movies. I thought, gee, you know, I'd like to do that someday. Because uh, I always enjoy doing things I've never done before, you know. I did a Broadway musical, gosh, I never expected to do that because, you know, the challenges are uh, keeping you on your toes. And I think you'll look for things that, uh, you know, challenge you and, uh, you know, that you're not just repeating yourself. But the advantage here was Chris Roberts. I had such a good time working with him. He not only is a wizard of all things uh, involving games, but he's a great director and a, a great friend. And really, when he asked me, I, I didn't even have to read the script. I just jumped at it. I, I, I uh, really wanted to work with him again. Of course, when they did the movie version of Wing Commander, they did the, the younger versions of all of us. And Freddie Prinz played me. And we're mistaken for each other all the time, so that's a natural choice. But, uh, you know, between Star Wars going back to the prequels and then Wing Commander going back to them and the Flight Academy, my wife was saying, can't you pick one franchise that works for us chronologically? <laughs> but, uh, and working with John Reese davies again, I, you know, I just adore him. He's such a good actor. And uh, we've had some, uh, you know, uh, Liam Cunningham and... Uh, Ian Duncan. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. I'm sorry to see it coming to an end, to tell you the truth. And unlike Wing Commander, we can see the monitor and see exactly the, the sets that they have. But this is really stripping it down to basics because, you know, it's very equalizing to see everyone dressed exactly the same way. It doesn't matter whether you're a principal player or a background artist, we're all dressed the same way. Uh, virtual sets. It really is, you know, you you spend a lifetime on movie sets and doing television and whatnot and, and you feel like you know something and here you're going back and learning it all over again. But it's not that different. I mean, you really, uh, it's all pretend. It, it, it's like when you're playing Robin Hood in, your, in the backyard. It, when you're nine years old, uh, people say, well, isn't it hard to imagine you're flying a spaceship? I said, look, you know, you've been in cutaway cars on a soundstage where they're just rocking it, and it's really no different than, than uh, more conventional scenarios. And action. All right, people, we're back in this. Racing stripes. Stop doubling up on targets! What's it like acting for a, a player character who has some freedom of movement within the space, whether your perspective of your audience is maybe looking over there or, or wandered off somewhere? Well, that's it. I mean, you're part of this gigantic uh, puzzle, in a way, and you're providing each little piece so that the players can put together their, their own scenario. My character in this uh, 
scenario is, is, is much more consistent. I mean, there's variations, option one, option two, in terms of what the player can do. Uh, on Wing Commander, there were three columns, and they were always radically different. There was neutral, there was negative, and there was positive. You know, somebody would come in and say, I have an idea. The neutral was, all right, I'll take it under consideration. The uh, positive was, what a great idea. I wish I'd thought of it myself. And the negative is, what are you bothering me with this garbage? Get out of my office. Which is fun, but it's terribly schizophrenic. I mean, normally you can arc your character and you say, well, I better play it this way so I can get to here, to point B, C, D, etc. But uh, again, once I understood the concept of of, of what they were doing, because, you know, I'm not really a gamer myself. I played games when the boys were small until I became Grandpa Simpson, where they would just laugh at me because my skills were so limited. I mean, I'd crash the ship trying to pull out of a hangar, and I, eh, I can't control this thing. Once your young sons are laughing, not with you, but at you, it's time to retire. So I like the, it's hard though, because, you know, over the years, and I've had young pilots come up to me and say, you know, I really got into flying playing Wing Commander. And when you get to level three, do you, and my eyes glaze over because I have to admit I'm a fraud, but I'm used to that. I mean, eventually the public becomes, the fans anyway, are much more knowledgeable about this sort of thing than I am. I, I hate to admit that I flunked a Star Wars trivia quiz, but I did. I, who knew what Han Solo was smuggling? They're going, Dad, it's spice. I went, oh, I, I don't know. If it was multiple choice, I might have done better. But you learn what you need to learn. Once you're f finished with that, you really have to forget all that so you can make room for more material. So, uh, you know, I forget these things, uh, but there's all kinds of supporting ancillary books and novels and, you know, offshoots where there's so many more details that I, I'm not familiar with. And it's endless learning. I mean, as you notice, I brought my script with me so that if there are any breaks, I can memorize what I have to do after lunch. It's never ending. Perhaps to wrap up then, I was going to ask, you've seen sci-fi fandom particularly from so many angles, like, yeah. you know, probably from the beginning of, I guess, really organized sci-fi fandom with Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Has your relationship with it changed over the years? Your attitude towards it changed? Well, I was a fan. I mean, as a kid, I was just mad about the original King Kong. I loved all the stop frame animation, Ray Harryhausen pictures and horror and uh, fantasy. You know, I loved all the black and white universal films. I still do. Uh, when I realized, I think I saw a documentary of, on the Disneyland show, which it was called then, where you saw Clarence Nash recording the voice of Donald Duck. I don't know if I was six, seven, but it, it, it suddenly occurred to me, these things don't just emerge full blown. Somebody goes to work and actually makes a Daffy Duck cartoon. <laughs> and I thought, I want to do that. I mean, I wasn't sure I wanted to be an actor. I thought I could, I didn't know what I wanted to be, but I certainly wanted to be in the business of going to work and having a colossal ape carry a woman up the Empire State Building. I thought, I, you know, it was just mind boggling to me, you know, that, that uh, somebody got to do that for, for their profession. And, you know, I've been very lucky because like I say, I used to go to these fan conventions because I wanted to see films like The Silent Metropolis, Things to Come, movies I'd read about, but never had the opportunity to see. There weren't even revival houses that in those days uh, that, were, that I was aware of. And uh, I went to one of the very first, if not the first, sci-fi convention uh, at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. There were like 15 comic book dealers, three projectors, and I maybe 500 people all told. Uh, and then you contrast that with what the San Diego cons become. It's upwards of 200,000 people. It's corporate sponsored, so it's, it's really a, a different ball game now uh, but you know I've felt such a bond with the fans because you realize without them you're nothing I mean uh, I was terrified you know when I got the part of the Joker I mean I was confident I thought well they're not going to cast the guy who played this icon of virtue to play this you know one of the all-time great villains so there was no fear of getting it 
I thought, I'm gonna go in and make them really sorry they can't hire me. Uh, you know, so I was cocky as all get out and driving away, I'm thinking, ha, that's the best joker they'll ever hear. Too bad they won't be able to hire me. Two weeks later, my agent called and she said, you know, you got it. I said, what? She said, you got the joker. I went, oh no, I can't do this. I mean, no matter what I come up with is going to be a disappointment. Can't you get me something a little lower profile, Clayface or uh, whoever, Hugo Strange? I mean, I knew Batman really well because, I, like I say, a big comic book fan uh, since a child, but uh, I just thought, oh, what did I get myself into? Because no matter what I'm going to do, uh, it's going to disappoint people. And in fact, I said, don't even bill me. I mean, bill me like Karloff in the original Frankenstein. It says the creature, question mark. Because I said, I don't want people to prejudge uh, the performance. They did that with Michael Keaton on Batman, and he turned out to be brilliant in that part. But fans are very particular. Uh, but uh, like I say, they, they almost become like uh, family because they're so supportive uh, in everything you do. Uh, and I, you know, uh, like you say, the fandom has become so much more organized now with the internet. They have, uh, there's so much, there's voluminous material out there uh, that they put out. Uh, it's crazy though. Uh, this NDA stuff, people don't know, non disclosure agreement, where you're not allowed to talk about anything. I, I have something coming out where they, they there's a, uh, an amount of money that if it leaks, because of me, I don't get that payment. If I keep it a secret until the day it comes out, I get that payment. But, you know, I, I'm good about uh, keeping secrets. I, I, I'm proud of the fact that I knew a year and a half before anybody else that uh, he was actually dad Vader. Uh, I didn't even tell Harrison, you know, so, uh, uh, and, or my wife, because I thought, you know, you know, she, it would be terrible if she, you know, said, you know what, to a fan and it got out because Irvin Kirshner said, I know something, I'm going to tell you, George knows, meaning George Lucas, I know and I'm going to tell you and if it leaks, we'll know it's you because the line originally was, you don't know the truth, Obi-Wan killed your father. And he said, we're going to take out that line and put in, I am your father. Well, I thought, well, first of all, if Sir Alec Guinness is the real villain, that's a pretty good twist in and of itself. But this is even better. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. It was, you know, just a mind-boggling plot twist. But uh, I still remember when we saw the first screening, Harrison turned to me and said, you never told me that. I said, I know, but I, I, I would have gotten in trouble if I told you. So... Now it's happening all over again. I'm not even authorized to tell you I'm in episode seven. It's all secret. I wanted you to ask. And you should see the NDA I signed to get here. <laughs> <laughs> hey Chris, one, one final quick question. All right, um, I was just gonna ask, like, given that this project was um, so much funded by people who liked Wing Commander in the first place, like, do you have any kind of, I guess, message to those people who will be probably the most excited people to, to see this when this news finally breaks out of that NDA? Well, thank you. I mean, it, it's extraordinary, the amount they raised. Uh, you know, I'm happy to be back with Chris. Clearly, the fans want to see us back together, and, uh, you know, we have our work cut out for us because what was cutting edge all those years ago is probably uh, looks funny to them now, you know, like silent movies or, you know, something from the 30s. Uh, and again, we have the bar set high, and uh, uh, again, I, I'm totally confident with Chris. I mean, uh, I'll ask him a simple question. Uh, 20 minutes later, he's still talking about all the, you know, he really knows where he is at any given moment, and he's my guru. Without him, I'd be lost. But I do want to thank the fans. I mean, I, I really want to thank the people that responded to the, uh, the effort to get this made because uh, without them, I wouldn't be here.